So today I'll be talking about uh, what in the world is the millennium. When uh, Pastor Edwin and uh, Pastor David uh, asked me to speak on this topic, I was taken aback because uh, in my talk on the Bible prophecy on the end times, I have not covered this topic, the millennium. Uh, those of you who attended my talk last month, you would have noticed that uh, this topic, the millennium, is absent. It's, I didn't cover on it. There's a reason, and you will know the reason towards the end of this talk. Right? So, I said, okay. Now, before we delve into the, uh, what the millennium is all about, let's look at uh, Scripture. If you have the Bible with you, turn to Revelation chapter 20, and I'll be reading from Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 6. Right? And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan and bound him for a thousand years. He knew he threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be free for a short time. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So you see up on the slide, there are certain words that I've highlighted in blue. And we will cover all right, uh, what, what, what uh, is meant by the abyss and so on. So you can see here that uh, before the millennium starts, Satan is being bound. Before the millennium starts and before Satan is bound, we read in Revelation chapter 19, and uh, we note that in the words given in blue, the beast was captured together with it, uh, the false prophet, and the two were thrown alive in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. So before the millennium starts, before Satan was bound, the beast and the false prophet, the two characters uh, in the end times, will be thrown in the lake of fire. And what is this lake of fire? We will look at it uh, shortly. Okay. Next. First, we looked at the abyss. The abyss or in some uh, versions, is the bottomless pit. It's actually a place where God keeps demons captive until the day of judgment. Okay? And this is uh, given in Luke chapter 8, verse 30 to 31. And this, what is this lake of fire? This lake of fire, if we read Matthew chapter 25, this lake of fire is actually eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Or in Matthew 25, verse 46, it says, eternal punishment. In Mark, it is hell, where the fire is not quenched. So it's eternal fire, it's hell, right? And uh, it is for the demons as well as the unrighteous. In other words, the lake of fire is another term for hell. In Revelation chapter 20, 
verses 14 to 15, we read that death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and the lake of fire is the second death. Which means that death and Hades is not the lake of fire. It's not hell. Okay? Because sometimes we tend to use the term hell, Hades, and all that uh, quite synonymously. But in actual fact, according to the Bible, they are Hades, which we will cover in my next slide, right? is not hell, is not the lake of fire, as given in Revelation chapter 20 and actually there are other verses. And, in, and who will be in this besides the demons and the, you know, the fallen angels and uh, as well as uh, Satan eventually? It says in Revelation chapter 21, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, idolaters, and liars. At the point of judgment, okay, the white throne judgment, the, the, these people will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. So, now that we are clear based on scripture, what is the abyss and what is the lake of fire, which is the second death, is also hell. So what is death and uh, Hades about? Hades is the dwelling place of all dead. At the present moment, you know, all the dead are in the place called Hades. And in some version, it is uh, you, the word grave is used. Some versions, they call it shoal. So shoal, Hades, or grave is a dwelling place of all dead without distinguishing the righteous and the unrighteous at the moment until the great white throne judgment. And this is given in Luke 9, uh, 16, verses 19 to 31, when you read about it, uh, Okay, this is uh, the conclusion that you come to. And there are other verses as well, as I've given to you in Psalms 49. Like sheep, they are destined for the grave or shoal in some versions, and death will feed on them. And God will redeem my life from the grave. He will surely take me to himself. So you can see that there's a distinction Clearly, Hades' show is not the lake of fire. Right? Again here, if you look in Psalms 88, it says, Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do those who are dead rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave? Show your faithfulness in destruction. Are your wonders known in the place of darkness? So the grave, Hades or show, is also a place of darkness. At the point of rapture, the dead will rise, as we read in the New Testament. Okay? Yeah. Now, being clear with these terms, now we come to the views on the millennium. Millennium simply means a thousand years. But there are three views, as I've shown here. Uh, there are three views on the millennium. One view is the A millennium, which is actually a denial of uh, a physical millennium, 1,000 year period here on earth. Okay. So the, those, who, the, those who take the view of uh, A millenniumism actually sees the millennium as the present reign of the deceased believers together with Christ in heaven. That means when Christ was crucified, he crushed. Basically, he, there was victory over the, the Satan, and Satan is already bound. So the air millennium view takes the, the position that Satan is already bound, and the millennium is really referring to a long period. Okay? Uh, not uh, fiscally a 1,000-year period. So this is the view. And now, 
the deceased and Christ is already ruling in heaven. Although on earth, the church is still going through uh, some persecutions and all that. So there's a, you know, uh, two, two conditions. Okay? And the, these two conditions, that means the earth, the Christians, the church, right, uh, still suffering, going through sufferings and all that on earth, while the deceased and Christ rules in heaven. And this will come to full fruition when Christ comes back again. And then Christ will rule on earth eternally. So, so the, the air millennium view takes the, the, the view that it is not a literal 1,000 year period, it's spiritual. Okay? Uh, it's already happening. That means we are now in the millennium, according to this view. We are now in the millennium. While we are going through difficult times here on earth, uh, there are those who have gone before us, they are ruling with Christ in heaven, and Satan is already bound. Okay? So that's the view. And uh, it, the millennium is before the second coming and the resurrection. Then we have the post-millennium. The post-millennium view is by and large about the same as the a-millennium view, which says that uh, the millennium is figurative. It's not a physical 1,000 years. All right? Uh, and also, you can see that, uh, again, the millennium is before the second coming. Right? This is not a physical 1,000 years, but it is uh, figurative, uh, signifying, symbolizing a long period. But where the post-millennium view differs from the a millennium view is that this millennium, though it is not a 1,000 year period, it is physically on earth. It's physically on earth. Whereas the other one is that it's uh, in heaven. All right? But spiritually uh, ru ruling over the, uh, the, the earth. So the, oh, the difference between these two views is that one is physical, the other one is spiritual. And this view expects things to be better. We all know things are breaking down and there's a lot of uncertainty right, in this world. Those who take this view say that this earth will get better. Things will get better. Right? And we will enter into a golden age for the church where uh, righteousness will increase. And a vast majority of people will be safe, will come to Christ right, before Christ comes back again. So those who take this view of post-millennium is expecting our current chaotic condition to get better. Right? And then there will be a golden period for the church before Christ comes back again. And this golden period for the church fiscally on earth is that millennium period. All right? Uh, you can see a small asterisk red in red there. That's my view. <laughs> okay? I believe, like many others as well, increasingly, believe in the pre-millenniumism, uh, pre okay? Where it is a physical 1,000 years of peace under Christ on earth. Okay. And uh, the, those who believe in pre-millennialism, of course, there's another, there's, uh, another aspect. But in, in order not to complicate things, I will just take it as one. Actually, those who believe in pre-millennialism, pre right, there are actually a, a few subcategories. Okay? But I will just stick to one for simplicity. Basically, the, it is a fiscal 1,000 years but that 1,000 years will happen after Christ comes back physically on this earth. Right? And then he will rule for 1,000 years and there will be a great judgment at the end of the uh, millennium. Let's get, I will get into greater detail on this. Now, why i more inclined to this view is that uh, first, I those of you who have heard me in my uh, talk last month, 
uh, will know that I, to me, Bible prophecy right, is fulfilled literally. Because in the past, everything was fulfilled literally. So there's no reason to believe that in the future, uh, it will be uh, basically allegorical or figurative and all that. Right? Christ came down physically to die for all of us. Okay? So uh, I believe in literal fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And in my talk last month, I mentioned that Bible prophecy, in fact, the Bible is focused on two things. Yeah? And this to me is the reason why there's a millennium, a thousand year period. Right? The Bible prophecy is about two things. It's about God's holy land and it's about the Lord Jesus. Right? The, those of you who have heard me the last month, Right. Anything outside these two, uh, all right, it's uh, the Bible prophecy is silent about it. All right, it must be related to these two things: God's land, holy land, and the Lord Jesus. And the millennium is also for this purpose. Why God's land? It is to fulfill God's covenant with Abraham. What is God's covenant with Abraham? I share with you, it is a very unusual covenant for two reasons. It is a, a covenant made by the Almighty God with mortal men. Usually, a covenant or an agreement is with two parties who's got something to put on the table, equal, equal, uh, more or less equal in standing. But in this case, this covenant is unusual because it's a covenant made by Almighty God with mortal men. What has man got to give to God? All right? And it's unusual for another reason. The one who signed on the dotted line is God. Because it's written for us that Abraham fell into a deep sleep. You see, the... In those days, a covenant, right? The, if you are, the signing of the covenant is, walking, is signified by walking through the cut animals. Right? So when you walk through the cut animals, and if you don't fulfill the covenant, then you'll be like the dead animals, okay? The cut animals. And God, in his graciousness, put, Adam, uh, put Abraham into a deep sleep. So Abraham did not walk through the cut animals. It was God who walked through the cut animals. So in our day and age, it's like God signed on the agreement, but Abraham did not sign. Why? Because God knows that if men were to go through, men will not be able to fulfill his part of the deal. That is why God, in his graciousness, put Abraham to sleep. So Abraham all right, did not sign the covenant as he were. And what did God uh, promise Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant? God promised Abraham the whole region right, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. Now, this here in blue is actually the area of David's kingdom. Okay? You look at Israel today. Israel is only a fraction of what uh, was David's kingdom in the past. Some say that actually the area which God promised right, to Abraham and descendants was even larger. Okay? Some say that it's even larger. And then, so, you look at Israel today, Israel is only that small little t sliver of land there. Okay? And this is, as I've shared last month, this is one of the reasons why Jesus has to come back again. Because God, our God is a covenant-keeping God. 
up to now, okay, up to now, at this very moment, God has still not fulfilled his part of the deal because he promised Abraham and Abraham's descendants a much larger piece of land. Alright? And this is the first reason why there must be a millennium period where Jesus will come back and rule as king to the land promised to Abraham. So this is one of the reasons for the millennium. Okay? And it's given to us in Luke chapter 1, verses 32 33. It says, Jesus as king in Jerusalem on the throne of David and the house of Jacob to fulfill the promises God has made to Israel. So this is one of the reasons why Jesus has to come back again and he has to come back to establish this kingdom fiscally. Remember, the fulfillment is literal. Okay? So what's the other, the other purpose of the, the a millennium period and is that apart from being a covenant-keeping God, we also have a long-suffering and redemptive God. Why? Ever since Adam's sin, okay, 1,000 years after Adam's uh, sin, the world is recorded for us, the world did evil in God's sight. And God has to redeem men through the flood. We all, we all know about the Noah, the flood, and so on. And in that first redemptive act of God, God redeemed a family of eight. A family of eight people was kept safe in the ark while God flushed out the evil in the world. After a period of time, man did evil again. So now God increased the pool size. He raised a group, a race, the Jewish people, and even dwell amongst the Jewish people to guide them and all that. Still, they did evil in God's sight. And God's third redemptive act, He sent His one and only Son down here to die for the whole world. You can't go beyond that really because, right? So, God's third redemptive act was sending His Son down to die for the sins of the world and if we accept, then we will have the salvation, right? One would think that this great act would make the world a better, or the earth a better place to live. Look at the world today around us. War still ongoing, we are all facing all the difficult times uh, that's coming our way. So that is why when Jesus hung on the cross before he gave it, brief his last, he says, it is finished. The next time he comes, he will come as judge. There won't be a fourth redemptive act of God. And God waited for 6,000 years okay, to give us a chance to come back to him. But uh, look at the world today, still full of evil. And God has already prophesied and uh, is, given, is given to us in Timothy. Second Timothy says that in the last days, there'll be a period of decadence. Yeah? Materialism, hedonism, secularism, people will be lovers of self, Right? Lovers of money and so on. So, indeed, we are seeing all this all right, uh, breaking down of societies and all that in our world today. So, Jesus has to come back again, not just as a covenant keeping Lord, but as a righteous judge. And this is given uh, to us also in Malachi chapter 3 and uh, to chapter 4, Jesus will come back to distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, those who serve God and those who do not. Those who serve God will be spared. 
thank God that uh, He's gracious, right? Despite our failings and all that, if we accept Him, He will accept us as sons of God. Okay? So, He's going to come back for the great white throne judgment. Yeah. So, in view of this purpose of why the millennium and in view of what's happening around our, us and all that, we can see that the pre-millennium view, right, pre-millennialism view, tends to be more accurate because Jesus is coming back for two purposes. To restore the Holy Land according to the promise made to Israel, to Abraham, and to restore the earth to its original state of righteousness. Right? And Bible prophecy is also about that. God's land, the Lord Jesus, and restoring the earth. Okay. So, with this, let's go in a little bit deeper into the timeline and you know, some of the details of the millennium. It's quite complicated, this slide. Uh, as usual, my slides, some of it can be quite complicated. But I've marked it one to uh, four. So let's look at one. Before that, let's look at the timeline. Premillennialism means a literal 1,000 years. Yeah? And this literal 1,000 years comes after tribulation and God's wrath. I have not separated this. Those of you who have heard me knows my stand on uh, tribulation and God's wrath. But uh, today is not about you know, uh, pre-trip rapture or whatever. Today is about the millennium. So I put them together. So pre-millennialism, right, believe, we believe in 1,000 years literal, and that 1,000 years, we all know why, for two purposes, and it comes after the second coming of Christ. But before the second coming of Christ, we have the first resurrection. Just now when I read uh, Revelation chapter 20, uh, if you remember, it talks about the first resurrection. So if there's a first resurrection, there must be a second resurrection. Correct? Yeah. So you see, and I believe that the first resurrection is actually the rapture. And this is given to us in 1 Thessalonians 4. Of course, there are other verses. But 1 Thessalonians 4, what does he say? He says that at the trumpet, you look at the words in blue. He said at the trumpet call of God, those of us who are alive okay, and are left will be caught up together with them. That means the dead. The dead will rise first. And where are the dead? The dead are in the shoal or Hades. They will rise first. And uh, those of us who are alive will join them and we will meet the Lord in the clouds. That's the rapture. And then... If you read Revelation chapter 19, Jesus comes back again, okay, in the battle of Armageddon, and Satan will be bound. Okay? The beast and the false prophet is already in the lake of fire, already in the lake of fire. So they, they are already out of the way, okay? And then this millennium, 1,000 years will be Jesus' rule on earth. After the, the millennium, there will be a second resurrection. This time is everybody. Okay? To be judged at the great white throne judgment. So the millennium, some of the verses with regards to the millennium, if you look at number two, right? As I shared with you just now, Luke 1, Luke chapter 1, verses 32 to 33. Christ will rule as king in Jerusalem. In Zechariah 14, it's also written for us that the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be only one Lord and his name will be the only name. Then we have the second resurrection. 
What happens at the second resurrection is given uh, to us in Daniel chapter 12. If you look at Daniel chapter 12, it says that uh, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, those who believe in Christ to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Because why? They'll be thrown into the lake of fire. So the great white throne is, okay, is where everyone will be judged. And uh, in Revelation 20, it says, John saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. So there's a book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. If anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he'll be thrown into the lake of fire or the second death. And uh, if you remember in Revelation chapter 20, it says that those who are raptured in the first, those who are resurrected in the first resurrection will not face the second death. Okay? Will not face the second death. Now, some of you may be wondering, but then the, how can there be only two resurrections? As what I've shown you in this slide. How can there be only two resurrections? Because remember Lazarus? Lazarus was resurrected, right? Uh, there are others, uh, Peter and Paul, each one, uh, they also you know, uh, uh, so-called resurrect. And if, if you remember when Jesus died on the cross, they say that the grave was open and some of the dead came out. Now, there is a difference between resurrection and uh, the dead being raised to life again. Here I have, there are actually ten Nine instances of people being raised from the dead. But let's look at resurrection first. Okay. And if we look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to uh, 54, here it says that uh, when the trumpet call of God is sounded, the dead will be raised imperishable. The key word here is imperishable. We will be changed. Right? The mortal with immortality. Remember when Jesus rose from the dead, he could walk through the, the walls. Right? Then we all cannot walk through walls, so Jesus must be different when he resurrected. He must be different from us. Right? So when we are at the point of rapture or resurrection, we mortals will be clothed with immortality and will be raised imperishable. Whereas the, the other nine accounts of people uh, who came back from the dead, as it were, right, like Lazarus, there I've uh, given you all the scripture verses here, there's no mention that uh, they did not die again. Actually, all these people who were raised from the dead, eventually they die. Okay? And they are not clothed with immortality. So that's the difference. They, these people were raised from the dead, but they were not resurrected, as it were. Because uh, why I, I have this slide? Because some of us are saying, oh, there are quite a number of resurrections. How come only one resurrection? So when... In the Bible, the resurrection or the rapture is where you are clothed with immortality or you have become imperishable. Yeah. Summing up this whole thing, you can see that the twofold purpose, first, to restore God's land and Jesus king over the land, then judging between the righteous and the unrighteous, restoring the earth to its righteousness state. So, after restoring everything back to original, 
then we have the new heaven and the new earth. Okay? So the, the, the purpose of the millennium is to eventually restore everything back to original, and then we have the heaven, the new heaven and new earth. And the new heaven and the new earth is a very is a place where we all yearn to be because it's given to us in Revelation chapter 21 that the new heaven and the new earth is a place where there's no more death, mourning and crying or crying in pain. And there's one interesting thing which I want you to note is this. John says, I did not see a temple in the city. That means there's no temple in Jerusalem. I know some of us will be hearing about the third temple and all that, right? So this is a very interesting thought for you. Because why? The Lord God and the Lamb are its temple. is given to us in Revelation chapter 21. In Isaiah, there's also a, a corresponding uh, verse. So this new heaven and new earth is when the lamb and the wolf, they feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. So this is the utopia, okay? the paradise that we all uh, yearn for, okay? or look for. No, no more cancer, no more pains, nothing. All right? Because, and there won't be any hurts as well. So this is the ultimate paradise that we are uh, aiming for. But now, the reason why I don't talk about this, I, I did not talk about this in my, all my talks. I've been talking about Bible prophecy for 12 years now. And in all my talks, this is the first time you're hearing from me on the millennium. Why didn't I talk about the millennium? Because our focus should be on the rapture. You see, it's like, it's like uh, taking a cruise ship to your ideal destination. Yes, the, the destination may be ideal. Okay? It's the ideal destination. But if you are not on board the ship, you will not get there. So knowing about focusing on the millennium and focusing on the new heaven and new earth, you will not get there if you miss the boat. So we need to prepare ourselves for the rapture. Okay? And that's the first resurrection. If you miss the first resurrection, you can dream of the destination. You won't get there. And that's the reason why I did not touch on uh, the millennium. Because I want us to focus on preparing ourselves for the rapture which is more important. Once you are on the boat, you will get to your destination. Because once you are raptured, you'll be with Christ. And then you follow him all the way. There won't be a second death. Alright? So that is, that should be our focus. Now with that in mind, then we have to ask ourselves, oops, where are we now at this point in time? At this juncture, if rapture is what we are to focus on, then is Jesus our Lord and Savior. For those of us who are still considering, uh, contemplating, uh, I pray that uh, you, know, you seriously search the scripture or, or talk to a mature Christian to find out more about Jesus because please don't miss the boat. If you miss the boat, you will not reach your destination. And for those of us, for those of us who are believers in Christ, uh, the parable of the ten virgins, keep watch. Keep a close walk with the Lord Jesus because the parable of the ten virgins, the virgins signify the church because we are the bride of Christ. The Bible warns us not to be asleep because when the bridegroom comes and we are not ready for him, we are going to miss the boat. 
Okay? So for those of us who are Christians, who are believers in Christ, don't be like the five virgins who become drowsy and fall asleep. Keep watch and keep walking closely with the Lord. All right? And those of us who are keeping watch, I have another uh, thing for you is we are now in, the, the world, in a world where there are a lot of fake news, fake videos, all right? Uh, and uh, there's a lot of deception all around us. So those of us who are keeping watch and all that, we also have to do one more thing. We have to be discerning. And I like what uh, Pastor Derek Prince uh, tell us to look out for. Okay? He, in, in one of his sermons, he talked about who are the candidates for deception? Those who are ignorant of Scripture. So please be like the Bereans. All right? Be knowledgeable of Scripture. Don't rely on the you know, uh, subjective impressions, all the dynamic stuff and all that. So, always re go back to the Bible. Whatever you hear, including myself today, whatever you hear, always go back and check Scripture to s and walk closely with the Lord. And rather than looking at uh, all the, you know, uh, supernatural signs and all that stuff. And also, and this is especially to speakers like us, right, is the last one. The speakers like, like our, myself, right, we got to guard ourselves against flattery, right, in trying to increase, uh, to get more people to, to, to come, to like you and all that. You say what they want to hear instead of what the Bible says. Okay. So there are, uh, you know, this temptation, especially for speakers and all right, the, to 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 say what people like to hear. All right, so we have to we have to guard ourselves against this. So with that, right, I hope now you have a better idea of the millennium. But where is your focus? And Walk closely with the Lord to be knowledgeable in the Bible. All right, thanks.